Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Intelligent Transport and Siemens Mobility, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this afternoon. I'm your moderator for today, Luke Antonio. I'm the editor at Intelligent Transport. Uh, today's speakers are going to be Robert Bix uh, Bixel, product owner for Mobility as a Service Solution at Siemens Mobility, Jan Hellebrandt, product owner for Traveller Relationship Management at Siemens Mobility, and Thomas Wolf, Head of Sales for Intermodal Solutions at Siemens Mobility mm -hmm. and Chief Operating Officer uh, HAFAS at Harcon. So following today's presentations, we're going to move on to a live question and answer session where our audience can pose questions to today's speakers. Please remember that you can submit questions at any point during the webinar, just using the questions panel situated in the menu on the right hand side of your screen. So without further hesitation, allow me to pass over to today's first keynote speaker, Thomas Wolf. Well, hi everyone. And uh, also from my end, a uh, very warm uh, welcome. Uh, we're excited to, to have gathered such a large audience uh, today and look forward, of course, to conduct this webinar with you. Uh, I mean, right now the, the planes and the buses and the metros, they're kind of empty. I think we're, we're down by more than 90, 95%. Uh, but hey, this, this pandemic is going to be over uh, someday soon, and then uh, uh, it's going to get crowded again. Uh, so let's let's do our homework and, and use the situation uh, to gear up for the challenges ahead of us. Uh, I'm now going to switch off my video to save some bandwidth. Uh, and also, uh, hairdressers have been closed in Germany for three weeks now, so I'm going to spare you my COVID-19 haircut. All righty, uh, let's, let's get started then. Um, uh, and we'd like to start actually with the uh, the division that we that we uh, have with our company, uh, and it's, it's about uh, sustainable and seamless travel. And I, I think it fits very well to uh, mobility as a service, uh, because Mass is not just about uh, riding a bus or a metro. It's about a complete and, and and very comprehensive mobility concept, which includes all options on mobility. And this this quality of life aspect, I think, is very interesting because every individual is going to interpret this differently. And since Mass brings together many stakeholders and many individuals, uh, there's there's a good chance of having somewhat of a, of a clash of, of interests. And, and, and let's look at this a little uh, more close up. Um, the, the biggest difference is obviously between the public and individual interest. Now, the, the public wants, you know, low emission and no congestion, but each one of us, uh, at least most of us, they'd love to just grab a cup of coffee in the morning, hop into the car, turn on the radio, and drive all the way to the office. And obviously, those two interests, the public and individual one, they're, they're, they're conflicting, right? Um, now, Mass uh, presents us with a, a, a good opportunity to balance these interests uh, because the public, they can reach a consensus and then implement it uh, using mobility as a service. Um, and just you know, providing good transparent information, pricing strategies, incentives, they can all help to balance these, these interests. Uh, for example, in Luxembourg, we, compare, we compare complete trips door to door, uh, including time to park your car and walk to your office and, and, and congestion and slow traffic. In this way, we have a fair comparison between car and public transport. And uh, that actually makes sure that public transit looks a whole lot more competitive uh, than it used to. Now, I would like to stress that a lot of times mobility as a service, uh, people say it's complicated, it's, it's difficult, but this is why we would like to start with a rather simple uh, example that we would like to, to share with you. Uh, so on, on the right-hand side, you see one of our apps, and let me just start this little video here. And you can do trip planning and everything. And on the map, you see all the points of interests for public transport, the buses, the trams, the vehicles moving around and all that. And in addition, you see the scooters. Um, and uh, besides just providing the information, you can just select a scooter and you can just start a ride. Uh, and it's all within integrated within this one app. And then of course you ride along uh, and enjoy your scooter ride. And once you're done, uh, you can just click finish and you're done riding your scooter. Now, if we look at this, what did we just see in this very, very simple example? It, it's been a simple and intuitive user experience. Uh, it's been intermodal, uh, so it, it used several modes of transportation. Uh, it's, it's used one account because the, the user you know, didn't have to sign into several apps and, 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 and providers. There was no hassle with payments because the booking is integrated. 
and, and altogether it happened within one app. So bottom line, we have a simple example of mobility as a service in action. And the simple message here is, you know, mobility as a service does not have to be complicated. It can get complicated, but even simple examples uh, address pain points that our ridership has and our mobility as a service. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to just do a quick introduction on, on ourselves so that you know who you're, you're speaking to today. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have built uh, more than 80 systems uh, worldwide uh, with trip planning and, and, and ticketing. And typically you will not see the name Hakon or, or Siemens appear because all the solutions are branded by our clients. Um, our clients are mostly public transit agencies, uh, railway companies or metropolitan and, and governmental bodies. Now, just some facts and figures. Uh, and I think that the one that's mostly related to today's session, mobility as a service, is by means of our systems, uh, about 18 billion euros in fair revenues are being processed every single year. Just to give it an order of magnitude, that's about the complete fair revenue collection that we have uh, in the United States of America. And this year number shows how important passenger information and ticketing uh, in the digital world has become in, in mobility and how successful solutions can be. And you know, talking about success, just a few examples. In Germany, the DB Navigator, uh, it has reached 35 million downloads, considering that we are only 83 million citizens. That gives you, I think, a good impression of the penetration of just this mobility app. And then we have uh, in Dubai, a shale, uh, which we've chosen as an example here because it has a very tight and seamless integration of various modes of transportation. And there's a little country, Denmark, uh, they have 4 million downloads, but they're only 5.8 million people. Um, and this app has been so successful, uh, it has ranked number six in the most popular apps of all smartphone apps uh, in Denmark and it has actually beaten Google Maps. Message to all of us, um, if we do it right, mobility apps can be very successful and reach a, a huge audience. Now, the apps though are just, if I may call it the, the, the tip of the iceberg, uh, underneath there is a, a plethora of, uh, of tools uh, to uh, uh, support um, uh, the apps and if I, click on the presentation, it should actually show those tools. Um, and uh, we spend about 80% of, of our time uh, to actually build and, and enhance all these tools ranging from uh, real-time information, uh, processing, uh, public transit data nationwide, uh, disruption management and all that. And there we go. Um, and actually all these efforts have led to quite a huge um, uh, portfolio, uh, and that's provided by ourselves, that's Hakon, together with EOS Uptrade and Bytemark, and we all together belong to Siemens, and together we are about 600 professionals. Now, with this said, I'd like to start this session with a simple little survey um, and uh, better understand um, uh, how the, the audience uh, uh, is, is structured today. Um, so I'm going to start this little poll uh, right here and you should see four questions and I'd be thrilled if you would participate in this. Uh, so we would like to understand who we're talking to today and of course share it with you uh, and please select one if you're a public transit agency or two if you're a city uh, and more interested in orchestrating mobility, three in case you are uh, uh, new and shared mobility like bike sharing, car sharing, ride sharing, or four if, if none of the above uh, fits to your situation um, and uh, however you're of course interested in mobility as a service. So I see the answers coming in. I really appreciate your your input and we'll, we'll give it a few seconds and then I'll, I'll, I'll share the poll with you so that everyone knows what, how the audience is structured today. And I hope it's not gonna be 80% who just think their, their neighbor has mass too. Um, so by now the majority has voted. So I'm just gonna close the poll if that's all right for you and move on. 
And so here's your, so there's actually quite a, f quite a few that just think it's cool and, and their neighbor has one too, uh, but I think that works too. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, a lot of uh, folks, a lot of folks from, from PTAs, and then of course, uh, a huge share from new and shared mobility. So thanks for sharing that. I hope that's also interesting uh, for you. All righty, um, let's move on. Um, and as we, as we enter the, the, the topic, the, the first thing you wanna do is take a quick look at our stakeholders. Um, we differentiate between uh, the passengers uh, and riders and citizens uh, and the, the mobility providers, uh, which is uh, public transit agencies or new and shared mobility, uh, whoever offers transportation services, and then the city, or let's just say the, the governmental bodies. And if we look at the, the ridership, uh, what are their needs? Well, they simply wanna get from A to B. They'd love to stay informed. Uh, they wanna know what's going on in case of disruptions and delays. Uh, they need to uh, book and pay uh, mobility services and they want a customized experience because one size fits all will not work. Uh, then there's the mobility providers. They of course want to present their offering. Um, they want to get paid for this. And here's the one very important aspect. They want to be able to communicate with their customers. And that's a very crucial aspect of any mass platform because mobility providers, for example, a bike sharer, uh, he already has customers and he brings them to this platform and he'll be very nervous uh, to lose the touch with his customers. He wants to stay engaged and in close touch with his customers. Um, and last but not least, there's the city or governmental body. They hopefully have something like a public mobility strategy. And, you know, uh, they, they, with a mass platform, they will expect to implement this. Uh, and of course, they also want to stay in touch uh, with citizens and understand their mobility needs. All of this has led us to structure the platform uh, accordingly. So there's a customer and provider management managing both sides of the uh, equation, if you want. The two fundamental um, uh, building blocks, trip planning, information, and, and, and ticketing and uh, a plethora of tools and functionalities around uh, data which is uh, consumed and produced by the platform. Uh, and we, we make the service available through uh, any yeah, third party through uh, open APIs, uh, same to all the partners providing their mobility services. And for example, in the Bay Area, we've, we've simply deployed our, our back, end and back engine and, and have allowed local suppliers to, to do the, all the front end work. So, Today, uh, we of course uh, want to not talk about the complete platform, but focus on certain topics. Um, and what we have picked is uh, number one, this whole trip planning and passenger information part, because we think that's the, the, the fundamental building block. Uh, the trip you don't know about, it's not gonna be, be, be brought uh, to, to your consumer. Uh, second, uh, customer communication, uh, which we think is key, especially in these, ti in these times. And last but not least, provider management, uh, how do you interface with this plethora of providers? We have received a number of questions prior to this webinar around Corona or COVID-19. Uh, we'll try to pay attention to this as much as possible, but uh, we felt it's fair to not you know, hijack the webinar with Corona. Um, and at the end, in the Q&A session, we actually have compiled a number of uh, um, yeah, suggestions and, and ideas on how to deal with the situation. So with this introduction, I would love to hand it over to Robert, who is gonna head on to agenda item number one. Thanks, Thomas. Um, let me see if my controls work. Seems to work, all right. Um, thank you. Um, so as, as Thomas has said before, uh, we have a lot of apps in the stores that um, have managed to reach a quite high user number. And we're gonna look at a couple of the success factors that are underlying um, for, for, this, uh, for this issue. So first we're gonna look at routing strategies. Um, you have seen probably a lot of uh, these new and shared mobility um, providers popping up and providing an amazing customer experience. Uh, with their services. Um, what we do have to respect as well, though, when we talk about uh, a mass solution is the proportion of things. Um, so even though they, uh, the, the shared mobility providers do um, manage to provide a, a really amazing service, 
they are still less than 1%, uh, they still transport less than 1% of the passengers in a, an urban mobility scenario. The big bulk of um, passenger volume is transported by the public transport services um, of the cities. So you can say the public transport is kind of the backbone um, for mobility systems in urban environments. And this also needs to be reflected uh, in the mobility as a service platforms or in, in mobility apps uh, in general, because otherwise your market is going to be limited to the 1% um, that the shared mobility um, makes up. Um, in order to still provide the convenience and the flexibility that the shared mobility uh, brings onto the, uh, in, onto the table, um, intermodal routing can be uh, a very interesting solution. And now I'm trying to push a button. Okay, there it is. So this is what our routing strategy looks like. We put the public transport at the center of our solutions as the backbone, as you see here in the middle. And we have the new and shared mobility modes um, in the beginning of the trip and in the end of the trip in a kind of a, a feeder fetcher framework or first, slide, first mile, um, last mile situation which, as I mentioned, uh, provides the opportunity to um, transport a lot of people and provide the convenience at the same time. Um, as Thomas has mentioned, we, uh, we do um, have some special um, issues right now with Corona, uh, so people might be a bit reluctant to use the public transport. Um, that will, of course, influence um, the, the routing strategies applied uh, in mobility platforms. Next aspect we're going to look at, and again, focusing on um, success factors for having high user numbers on these mobility as a service platforms, um, the, the trip searches need to be strongly tailored towards the, the customers, the passengers that actually use these services, right? Everybody has different needs uh, in terms of, um, of mobility, um, and you want to be able to choose them to be included in the routing. You want to be able to choose your preferred modes of transport. So some people might uh, might accept it or might find it a, a good thing to use a, a bike um, somewhere in the in the travel chain. Other people will be more reluctant to do that. Um, same thing with walking, walking speed, walking distance. Um, you might find 500 meter acceptable. Other, other people might find one and a half kilometers as an acceptable walking distance. All of this can be and has to be respected. And then we have people with reduced mobility. Uh, for example, someone in a wheelchair. We need to make sure that we propose routes that are actually feasible without any stairs uh, standing in the middle as an obstacle. And then as well, we enrich the data and we need to enrich the data with the information that is relevant to the passenger. Something that is gaining importance um, now in recent time is the CO2 footprint, which can be simply calculated and indicated as a number or as you see here in the screenshots displayed in a, in a bit more playful way with, with the green leaves. Uh, we're gonna look further into that um, further down the line of this webinar. Uh, weather information, for example, if you have a bike trip included, you wanna know if it's gonna rain. Um, Thomas already showed in, in his last video points of interest. This can be public transport station. These can be also restaurants or bars or, or something like that. And what might pop up in the foreseeable future as well is some kind of a, a measure of corona safety, which means of transportation will provide you with a better safety um, in times of, uh, of this pandemic. But then of course, the entire thing uh, is only as good as uh, the data that it is based on, right? So it starts with plan information, of course, but then you also um, have these two boxes on the right-hand side uh, that are a bit more challenging. For So first of all, we have disruption information uh, in our systems. So information about um, roadworks, for example, or, or closed tracks, railroad uh, tracks, that kind of stuff. Um, and then real-time information about train delays, uh, traffic jams, and so on and so forth. And all, these, uh, all this information needs to be processed and put into um, the, the mobility as a service platform so that the routing can take it into account because passengers will quickly realize if they're offered the best route or if it's only the second best because um, the information hasn't been handled properly. Uh, and handling this information is quite challenging. It needs to be consolidated from different data sources. Um, there are no um, real uh, consistent data structures, so it needs to be, it needs to be cleansed. Uh, a certain level of consistency needs to be reached 
in order to provide a good um, level trip planning uh, advice. So with all of that, um, we can we can feed that into uh, into our trip planning system, and in the jungle of uh, possible routes that uh, are possible for the passenger to um, get from A to B, the trip planner will then choose uh, cheapest routes or fastest routes and make them available to the passenger, or maybe also um, in, in foreseeable future, um, corona-proof uh, routes. Now, to show you that we're not just talking, but that we actually have these things um, productively um, available in the app stores, I'm going to show you an example that I recorded last week. Uh, this is from the Mobilitätszentrale in Luxembourg that Thomas has already mentioned. Uh, you can download this and play around with it yourselves. It's productively in app stores. Okay, let me try to start the video. Oops. Somehow it is not working. Now we get it. Okay, let's jump into it. So first thing I'm going to show you is how we customize such an app or how we have set up the customization in this very particular uh, instance. So you see all the possible modes of mobility, uh, train, tram, bus, even school buses are in there, bicycle, so your own bicycle or bicycle sharing. You can select um, uh, the car option to uh, give you, to say that you have your own car available for use. Um, you can choose to um, include electric car uh, power stations. Copilot, which is a car sharing scheme, is, uh, is available. And then you can go into the additional filters and um, give additional information about your mobility behavior. For example, you can say how many transfers you would like to have. Um, you can say um, how fast you are at the transfer. Um, some people take a bit more time and uh, would like to have this respected uh, in the trip planning. You can say how long you need to access your car so that you can still do the trip planning from your couch and then start as soon um, as you're ready to go. You can customize, as I mentioned before, the walking distance to the stop. Um, you can indicate whether you are a rather fast walker or a normal walker or a, a slow walker. Um, and similar customizations are possible for the bike that we're not going to go into detail now. Uh, all, on the, all on the bottom you see um, the, non -barrier, uh, the, the barrier free access. So for people with limited uh, mobility, they can indicate um, their limits so that also this can be respected and that they are not rooted through a place that uh, goes through a, a staircase, for example. All right, now that we've customized it, uh, let's just do a quick example of uh, a trip search. So as a starting location, just for the fun of it, I chose uh, on the map a location uh, in the countryside so that you can see um, how this is combined together with um, a destination in the city. Uh, so something close to the city center of Luxembourg. And I click on search and get my mobility options. Um, here you see again uh, what I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the, the leaves that indicate how CO2 friendly, oops, now we dropped out again, how CO2 friendly something is. There you go. Okay, the controls is a bit. Okay, a bit further, okay. Exactly, so you have a pure car route, you have a bicycle route, you have a public transport route, for example, and you also find um, a combined route with a combination of uh, private car in the beginning and public transport in the end. We're gonna look at that more in detail in just a second. One more thing that I would like to mention here, um, you see the cost indicated uh, in some of the items um, in here, with, in, in the pure public transport route, there's no cost associated to it. And this is due to the fact that Luxembourg has chosen to make public transport free of charge for everybody. Uh, pretty cool feature. Unfortunately, it's not a feature of our app, but a feature of Luxembourg, but definitely something that we will be happy to see repeated again in the future. All right, so let's look at the detail of this trip. If we click on it, we can see um, first the car segment. Uh, that takes us to a uh, park and ride spot. 
uh, and there we do the transition to the regional train that takes us to the central station of Luxembourg and in the end we have um, a bus ride that takes us to the final destination. And already here you see that there's a, a disruption message uh, marked here so that the bus stop is relocated uh, because the there's traffic works um, or road works um, at the central station of Luxembourg. Um, all right, we can follow the route on the map, of course, as well, just quickly to, to see what it looks like. Um, so you have the exact routing along, along the roads and you arrive at your final destination. All right, um, as a key takeaway for this first part, I would like you to remember that um, what I summarized in this very brief um, quote, a trip not found will not be sold, uh, and trip planning is a solid foundation for Mars. So it really depends on how you present the mobility that is available to your, to your customers, to the passengers, so that they see what is relevant to them and that they have the opportunity to buy the most advantageous uh, means of mobility available to them. And with this, I hand over to Jan for the customer communication module. Thanks, Rob. So, um, already one announcement at the beginning. Uh, please start your mouses. There will be also a voting coming up soon. So, let's go into it. Uh, I've been, uh, I will be talking about terms like new services in my ecosystem in my chapter. So I would like to make a little bit clearer what I mean, because there can be many, many de uh, definitions. So basically, transport as we know it today uh, is something like this. So there's a public transport, there's an individual transport, some kind of taxi services. And during the last years, new services has arrived and there are lots of them. Yeah, and this is kind of a short overview. So all these things, the the shared economy and all the service providers and many more, this is what I'm talking about when I mention new services and kind of the mass ecosystem. So your mice should be already warmed up. So now comes up a voting and it will be um, short, quick and polarizing. Yeah. Um, so I would like to know from you what mass should be. It, should it be just an extension of the current public service, so the new kind of tram, yeah? or shall also all the new, these new services um, be able to, to being a sustainable business? So I start the voting, you start the clicking, yeah? um, maybe during uh, during the wait for all your polls you know, um, the the mass solution and also the mass platforms are are quite often also referenced as a mobility marketplace yeah and this is a little bit um, the the point that I would like to to cover here in in the in the communication section yeah and um, I see the poll is much quicker now. This is good. So the warm up has helped. So we are currently at 75%. So I will stop voting and I will show the results. So to be honest, this is exactly the outcome I wanted to see <laughs> because I think then uh, most of the people are on, a, on the same page um, as the point of view that I would like to present. If you're not completely convinced um, by the poll, there is always some kind of a question that, that I keep asking me. Will this mass ecosystem survive also without being a sustainable business? Yeah. So is it still a mass Yeah. if all the new services are gone because they didn't survive, did, they didn't make the business? Yeah. There may be different opinions on that, yeah, but I think this is the question. So in the end, uh, I think most of us, or I would say we all want that all the curves go up. Yeah, The public transport 
should go up because there's some simply an additional modal shift to integrated transportation yeah and also the new services uh, will go up in this mobility mix because they establish a healthy mo uh, uh, or the mass helps to establish a healthy mobility ecosystem and uh, then we can focus on all the other things that uh, needs to be done out of these mass components this is the one that i would like to talk about so let's have a small look into this box for me customer centric functions uh, consist of customer support yeah then of course all the functions that are related to selling yeah customer management and this is the topic of the day uh, customer communication yeah customer communication is kind of uh, something that doesn't come into your mind as the first point if you're if you're thinking about an integrated mobility all the new services are completely living out of communication because they still need to reach as many customers as they need but the established uh, public transport infrastructure is kind of I would say not that much dependent on it so when we bring those two together it's, it's I think uh, it's very very uh, important to talk about such a such a merged system so um, how uh, communication or a customer life cycle is looked on I would say this is a small marketing 101 is uh, divided into phases first you need to communicate so that you get attention for what you would like to offer yeah so the people have to be aware that there is a new service that they can try additional options in the app that was currently used only for buses trams underground rail once you get their attention you need to get them to use it try it out yeah use it once use it twice what do you think uh, do you like it keep on using it and uh, the goal in the end is to keep this wheel rolling so that the people are satisfied with the new services they have also learned and adapted to this broader um, area of offering yeah this really door-to-door -door, uh, mobility and that they simply are the usual term is loyalty but they simply are accustomed that it current uh, nowadays simply mobility works like that that you take a tier or all the other microservices then there are of course some effects you would like to avoid yeah that the people are leaving your system that they are disappointed and therefore communication is the thing that helps you but right as i said it yeah there are different voices which say okay but there's we, we have a department for that yeah and uh, there's anyway already a budget for that and i see all our billboards all in the streets and uh, this is not my job anyway because i need to make sure that trains and and stuff is running and uh, that the business is uh, that the business is working um yes everything is true yeah and there is also a digital marketing budget usually um, i would like to point your attention on one thing how this marketing budget or especially digital marketing budget is spent about a third is spent on content and two-thirds are spent only on the media so this is money you give away so that somebody puts it on their platforms to show it to reach the customers um, the funny thing is we've seen all these uh, all these apps that Tom had presented and uh, Thomas also told you how high the adaptation is, how, down, uh, how high the, the download rates and popularity is. So what makes more sense than also integrate your communication channel in your very own app where all the customers already are? So we've done that. And this is a real world example uh, how these in-app marketing worked, how in-app 
uh, in app messages worked. So what we created simply is a is a pop-up that the uh, users only seen once. And the idea was, okay, there's a link which leads to a landing page. In this case, it was uh, looking for new bus drivers. And this is the Google Analytics of the landing page. Guess what? This mobile advertising was set up only for two days, so only for the weekend. And let's look at the results. We got 266 page impressions from native Google search. We got nearly a thousand from paid Google uh, announcements, so from uh, advertisement. And we got more than both of this together uh, natively from the app. So it has a huge, a huge impact. Yeah, you can communicate very efficiently with the customers that you already have yeah, if you just use your app for that. And yes, there is Corona. So uh, a few weeks ago, there were completely different screenshots, but um, we've taken these questions seriously. So we simply, sh uh, we're uh, showing some different kind of content. So especially in special times like these, it is important that you have a good way to transport your messages, yeah? be it informing about the measures that you're going to take. Um, also, what we see is that um, when an event happens, be it now Corona or anything else, yeah, all the uh, mainstream media is broadcasting about it because all the measures are usually the same for all the people. But when we're going to when there is this uh, uh, other phase where the measures are uh, are lowered, yeah, then we see that the different regions and the different businesses um, have to apply completely different rules. And this is a very good example of how uh, the the demand is here for very specific communication to specific target groups. A second uh, very important thing is to have a channel back. Yeah? So if there is some kind of issue, you uh, better get your, uh, um, your questions out there. You can ask their, um, uh, your customers, what do you think about this and that? And doesn't have to be Corona. Uh, it's also very important during the normal business, if you're offering new services, what's the feedback? What's the specific feedback? Take really, two seconds to give us a feedback here. Um, an example on where this leads. So if I have some answers and uh, some uh, kind of um, types of customer groups, then it's much easier for me to provide information which is much more targeted because it's nothing, you can do nothing worse than uh, sending out 5,000 pieces of information to a single person because majority of it is not important to him. So therefore, um, I would like to point out how important targeted information is so that the information is really reaching the right people. So this is my, this is my profile. I'm a parent, yeah? I'm a commuter in home office, yeah? I'm not a commuter in commuting, yeah? And the topics that are important to me is, okay, what are the measures I need to take when I'm in public transport vehicles? Uh, uh, what are kind of the, what is the information about lowering the measures? What changes? Yeah, I don't have any annual tickets. Yeah, uh, Payment for me is also not, not a thing because I only pay cash uh, contactless with M tickets. Yeah, But regional measures when traveling uh, between home and work location, this might be interesting. So in the end, out of all these types of informations, yeah, only these six six parts are would be really relevant for me. Yeah. So here, what we suggest is that you really look to minimize the amount of information that you put through, but increase the value. Uh, for the recipient of the specific messages. 
coming a little bit uh, back to the to the asking part. Asking is not only uh, important to get information from your customers, yeah, but it's also a very important part for your customers itself. There's a, a Cornell study uh, that we discovered, and there are some interesting findings. Yeah, first of all around 70% of customers will answer if they are asked. So there's kind of uh, goodwill here. And the even better thing is um, the responding to inquiries leads to improved ratings. The customer feels better when he can provide a response and it doesn't matter which response. Could be even negative, but it's a channel where he can communicate with uh, with the service provider. Yeah? It leads to increased care, uh, rating scores yeah? and a high uh, amount of consumers that the company cares more yeah? and the management cares more and their, that actions are taken yeah? if they can communicate back to specific topics and uh, uh, put out their opinion. A fun fact is there's a company who's asking a lot, which you might uh, consider as knowing all. It's Google. This is this is a um, review app. Uh, it's, a, it's a polling app from Google itself, and meanwhile, it's a, it's an own business. Where this is my kind of history here, where I'm regularly asked different questions and. Whatever I uh, want, I can answer it. The funny thing is, they are giving me some also micro benefits. Yeah, eight, eight cents here, ten cents there. But um, I participated in 277 surveys and earned 46 euro, which I can use in the uh, in the Play Store. So this is a, uh, this is the final important aspect. If you want something, you also need to be prepared to give at least a little bit. So consider also some kind of loyalty uh, scheme um, in your services, because this is something important also for the new services that the people benefit on it. And in the beginning, it uh, uh, these such loyalty schemes can be event driven. So just that the people do something. Yeah. They don't have to pay it. Look at it. Answer us. Give us feedback. Yeah. Try it out. Um, register for this feature. Something like this. Then of course there could be purchase driven things. So if you're using specific uh, services, if you're paying for something, then uh, this is some. Uh, uh, I think known aspect of loyalty programs. And the third thing is just for fun. Yeah. So there could be programs like a, a tiered thing where you simply achieve higher levels of something. Yeah. So you put a little bit of gamification for the customer's participation. And we've built it into our uh, it's into our mass platform. And what we are doing, we're calling it traveler relationship management in relation to customer relationship management, but, but we believe some of these or several of these use cases are really related to people on the move. Yeah. And kind of uh, here we provide all the functions and services that, uh, that are important that I've presented before. And now I would like to give back to Rob for the final segment. Thank you. I hope you guys can hear me. I had to switch microphones. I heard before my sound was not the best. Uh, all right. And the control is back. Good. We're going to look at the provider management now. So uh, to kind of see what is under the hood and how do all these things come together? How are the different um, sources of data and services combined? The control still doesn't work and someone okay perfect um 
So um, if we look under the hood, um, we are going to look into three uh, different topics that have translated into three different modules in our mass platform. that are essentially going to explain the challenges uh, that we have and how we, so we solve them. First of all, we're going to look at X mode, which is um, the engine that uh, brings together the data from the different various data sources. Then we're going to look at XBook, which is a similar thing uh, for the booking and ticketing side. And finally, we're going to look at XFlow to see how all these different means of transportation are um, combined together into one seamless journey. So this is what a mass platform looks like. The, um, or, or in general, the, the, the combination with the different uh, mobility providers. Uh, there is a connection to each and every mobility provider that needs to be managed. The challenge here is that there's very little standardization. In the public transport section, we have some standards, GTFS, Siri, and all of uh, these kind of protocols. But when it comes to the sharing economy and, and uh, all the new modes of transport, there's very little common ground. So um, this is um, what, where X mode comes in. So all these proprietary interfaces that each and every operator defines uh, for themselves have to be managed somehow. X mode takes care of this translation and translate it, translates it into a standard um, data model that can be used by the mass platform and that can also be shared um, with um, uh, our own um, defined X sharing interface or other um, defined interfaces where there are some certain standards. The nice thing about this setup is that uh, we have uh, an efficient and scalable way of integrating mobility providers into the platform. It is completely reusable and it provides a certain level of consistency within the platform because the, all the complexity is, is taken up by this X mode module on the bottom here. Similar thing with the X book module. So let's see what steps we need to run through if you want to book uh, a mobility service or purchase a ticket for a mobility service. Um, if we have a car, for example, we need to authenticate. So we need to um, log in with username and password to prove that we are the person that we claim to be. We reserve, we reserve the vehicle, we unlock the vehicle. We need to, uh, well, after we've um, driven around and finished our trip, We'll probably have to pay something for the services we used and we receive an invoice for that. Um, similar thing for the bike sharing. So you already see that there's a lot of steps that are in common, authentication, payment, receiving invoice. Um, this, these steps also apply to public service, uh, to, to the public transport operators, um, where you also authenticate, you pay and receive an invoice. Um, there are some items that are similar. Uh, for example, um, if I unlock a vehicle um, for the car sharing part, I might receive an access code uh, for a bike sharing service or I might receive a ticket um, for a public transport service. But all of these um, items have in common that it's some kind of entitlement to travel. Um, different workflows into a standardized um, workflow that the platform can, can use and can live with. So again, we just need a plugin to connect to the proprietary interfaces of the individual transport uh, providers. And we get a standardized way of dealing with the data and dealing with the services in the platform itself. Again, it was built for efficiency and scalability in the implementation phase. It is reusable and it can work with a consistent data model within the platform. Um, you've already seen this overview briefly um, when Jan talked about the um, travel relationship management. Um, we have integrated more than 80 mobility providers um, in our solutions um, up to today and more and more are coming um, into this framework. Um, so here again, um, I want to share with you that this is something that has been proven um, throughout our work um, in our sector. And then the question is, how do we combine this all together to um, get all these different little segments um, into one consistent trip? So let's say you have a, a journey where you start with a bike sharing uh, scheme, then you have a, a leg uh, for the public transport, and in the end, uh, you have a shared car that you're gonna use uh, for the final part of the trip. Now, if you want to book all of this trip in the beginning, you will face certain challenges. First challenge 
is at the first transition point here, right? namely, um, when is the ticket supposed to start its validity? Usually when you buy a ticket in an urban transport environment, it starts the validity right at the point where you buy it. Um, in this setup, you might want to um, drive to the station first with the bike before the ticket valid validity is triggered. Same problem at um, the second transition point where you move to the shared car. Um, usually, typically, a shared car has a reservation period of about 15 minutes. So if you reserve it all the way in the beginning, most likely your reservation will have expired by the time you get there. So also here, you want um, your, your mass um, platform and your app to support you um, with your journey and ask you maybe when you're 10 minutes out, would you like to reserve the car now? And then, of course, what happens if the car, meanwhile, has been uh, used by someone else and is not available anymore, your app will support you in uh, choosing a different option. So now I'm fighting with my controls again, yeah. Um, so essentially this is what Xflow does. It translates the individual's journeys, uh, sorry, the individual services of the transport providers into one seamless journey um, so that the passenger can really travel from A to B in one go. Again, uh, we have a number of advantages here. Um, it is built for uh, easy usability for the user. It is convenient to use, and it provides a completely seamless trip from A to B. As a takeaway for um, this last part, um, I would like you to remember that um, although all the, the front end uh, functionalities are very important and the communication with the customer uh, is key to the functioning of the platform, um, what is underneath it is indispens indispensable for uh, cost-effective and stable operation. And with that, I hand over to Thomas. Thanks, Robert. And um, I'm just going to uh, summarize really quick what we have uh, discussed and, 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 and seen today. And, you know, simple simple result is information is key as always, uh, but in this case, it's super crucial uh, I mean, just just you know, think about Google. You search for something, and uh, the result number seven or eight or nine, nobody will notice it. So making sure that uh, the right modes of transportation appear on top of the list is is crucial uh, for any mobility as a service platform. Uh, second, the seamless user experience. Uh, some folks actually uh, raised that question during the presentation, and I answered to some of them already. Uh, yes, uh, it is a crucial element because Mobility services are already available. Uh, there is taxi, there is scooter, there is bike sharing, um, and the, one of the the, the key uh, benefits of a mobility as a service platform for a passenger is the the seamless user experience. So having a tight and seamless integration for information, for booking, for payment, yes, um, that is a key issue. Um, then communication potential. Jan uh, touched on that. Uh, yes, if you're a bike sharer and you join a platform, uh, everyone understands you're nervous about sharing your customer data and uh, worrying about your customer access. But on the on the flip side, you win access to all the other folks. Um, so uh, I think everyone is a winner in that in that situation because now you uh, with a mass platform you have complete access to the complete mo mobile community and not just your own ridership. And I think everyone can benefit from that. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, under the hood, uh, the technical integration effort, uh, yes, uh, it, it is significant, it is relevant, it's nothing to ignore. Um, solutions are available, but still uh, we all wish there would be a simple standard and we could just plug and play. Um, uh, we, we have tools that help, uh, but still it is quite a bit of work, so you need to be mindful of that. So that's uh, my quick summary. Uh, and with this, I'll, I'll hand it over to our lovely moderator. Thank you very much indeed, Thomas. And thanks as well to, uh, to Robert and Jan for their uh, con contribution to today's presentation as well. It's really, really fantastic and insightful stuff there. I um, think, you know, you can, you can really tell, um, you know, this is what's holding people's attention even during a time like we're going through at the moment. Um, we can now actually begin the question and answer session where the speakers will be able to answer all of those fantastic audience questions that have come in. Um, for those of you um, in the audience, you can still submit questions using the questions panel in the menu on the right hand side, even as we're going through them. So for the first question, um, 
Thomas, I'm going to throw this over to you as I know you referenced COVID-19 right at the beginning of your presentation earlier on. You know, there's obviously going to be some impact on maths and we've had a lot of corresponding questions that have been raised by the audience. So perhaps just to summarise, you know, given the current situation around coronavirus, how do you see it impacting maths now and in the future, what could be done to tackle the situation? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do this very short and sweet because uh, as you just said, uh, there's been a number of questions regarding COVID-19 and uh, we have simply compiled a, a short list of, of, of issues where we can think we can help and we'll guide you through this. Uh, first of all, COVID-19, nobody knows all the answers, but uh, folks want to be well informed. So it's all about information and user engagement. And uh, we should we suggest this goes both ways. Of course, you can inform on how to behave in public, what uh, policies are in place, and we can spread this information in different languages and graphics to all different output channels uh, in a convenient and secure way. Uh, and also we can make sure that you get feedback from your ridership and learn about issues. And this can include, for example, tidiness issues. I think for the next months to come, uh, tidiness, cleanliness, transparency are going to be key because uh, let's let's be clear, uh, right now people uh, run away from public transport uh, because they're afraid of crowds and we'll, we'll have to win them back uh, to some extent uh, and information and transparency is going to be key. Um, so we, we offer solutions on that side. Um, biking, walking and car um, whether we like it or not, uh, we have seen a huge increase and in spike in, in bike travel uh, and there's going to be an increase in car travel because uh, again people avoid public transport and one way to answer this is in our platforms we actually treat them if you want equally. Uh, so here's an example from Luxembourg where car travel, uh, the car traveler is just as well informed as the public transit traveler. So we we, 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 we try to treat them equal, uh, which I think is very important in winning their hearts and their trust. Uh, and especially bike travelers, they're very sensitive, obviously, to the environment, uh, uh, elevation traveled, weather conditions, where can I rack my bike, where can I lock it up? Um, all this information we can include. And I think that's really key to, to kind of pay a little more attention to not just public transport, but to all the other modes of transportation. Because uh, if we lose the customer to someone else, uh, we'll have to win them back. Um, and then one very interesting element, we would almost call it like a COVID-19 routing, uh, occupancy information. You know, it, again, people will avoid crowded cars. So let's guide them towards the less crowded routes, the less crowded cars, uh, kind of, you know, try to space them as much as possible. Um, and there's there's something we can do about it. The information is available, and these are real life examples. It's not fiction. We're doing this already. And uh, once this pandemic has passed, we can still utilize this uh, technology uh, to better utilize the capacity that we have in public transport. Uh, we can of course also help to understand passenger movement and provide tracking solutions. And uh, last but not least, two really simple ones. Uh, you know, I mean, if you haven't introduced mobile ticketing yet, now is the time because obviously that's going to steer people away from touching ticket vending machines and all that and interacting with drivers. Uh, and then there's demand responsive transit, which we believe is going to be another key issue in bringing back public transit uh, into the mindset of, of commuters and, and travelers uh, because when you have a fixed route operation today, you already may consider that some of those fixed routes are not uh, economic. Um, and when you now go back into service in some areas or increase the service again, uh, you might want to use this opportunity to actually turn this into a demand uh, responsive transit right off the start. Uh, and we actually have a webinar on this next week uh, where we talk about public uh, demand responsive transit provided by PADAM. So these were a quick few thoughts on how to deal with uh, COVID-19 challenges. And with this, back to Luke. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Thomas. So I think, you know, as you said right at the start there, this is the information that people need to get through this challenge and through this time. So it's really great to have that kind of insight on today's webinar. Um, so having a look at some of the further questions we have here that touches on the, the second half of the second poll. Um, so a sound business model clearly is one of the main factors in enabling math and also of 
key interest to our audience here as well. Um, so a kind of general question, but an important one for our audience looking at how that poll was answered. Who should be the owner slash manager of the mass platform? You know, is it the state, the region, or is it a private company? Uh, I'm going to take this one. So um, two things. First, you asked about the sound business model. And then um, in the second part, I'm going to jump to um, who should be in charge of it. Um, can it be a, a viable business? In theory, yes, it provides a service, it provides a value. Um, it provides a value that um, other systems can't, um, as, as Jan has uh, pointed out as well with, with the travel relationship management. It has some very specific ways in which to create value. Um, it is going to be challenging to make it um, a completely viable business model, a self-sustaining business model in itself. If you look at um, the margin in the, in the mobility market, um, public transport is already heavily subsidized. Um, the sharing economy, the, the car sharing, bike sharing, scooter sharing, um, doesn't have it too easy right now. And also before the COVID um, crisis was facing some headwinds. So um, putting a, another layer on top that um, should be self-sustainable in itself is going to be challenging. Um, and this is why we have seen um, a lot of the, uh, the, the queries um, of, of entities that want to build mass platforms coming from public entities. So um, uh, public transport authorities, um, public transport uh, providers, um, or also um, cities or, or um, entities or the like. Um, who should be in charge? Um, we shouldn't be too restrictive on that. Um, as I've said, we have seen a lot coming from the public sector and we do believe that it makes a lot of sense um, that um, the entity that is in charge should at least be closely intertwined with the with the public sector. It should represent the public interest um, and not just the interest of a certain segment of people because we all need um, access to mobility. Um, and it should also um, provide the power to enforce uh, certain mobility strategies. If we look at the example that uh, I'd mentioned before, Luxembourg and also Thomas just um, took it up again, um, there the, 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 the government of Luxembourg has clearly said we want less cars in our inner cities. So they have set up this model with the park and ride outside of the cities, making public transport free and providing all this information and all, all the services around it through the app. So this is clearly um, um, an example where policy has, put into practice, has been put into practice through a mass platform. And we think that an entity that um, can, can do this and can, um, is, is close enough to uh, policymakers to translate that policy into practice, that is where the true benefit of mass is going to come out. If it's going to be economically sustainable in itself or whether there has to be subsidies, I guess that depends very strongly on the local context. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed for that, Robert. Uh, I think given the time, we'll take just one more question for today before bringing it to a, to a close. Uh, this one is all about data. Uh, so the question says, data is perceived to be king uh, with respect to math. So on one hand, there is the question of how big is the role of open data in math? And then on the other hand, will vehicle data remain the sole property of car manufacturers? Uh, what is your understanding and approach in, in this kind of context? Um, I'll, I'll take this one again. I guess it goes in my direction. Um, I, I totally agree uh, to begin with that the role of data is huge. I mean, after all, the mass platform is um, all about exchanging data with all the different stakeholders, right? Um, so first of all, we need to ensure that data can be shared efficiently. And this is where standards are incredibly important. Um, as we said before, X mode and Xbook only exist because we do not have the standards that we would like to have. We would love to see a world where um, the data exchange is being more, more um, standardized. And also um, on the other side, the, the services that we provide, we believe in, in this um, openness of, of these services and the data flow associated with them. Uh, for example, in, in the Bay Area around San Francisco, um, the, the trip planet that we have set up there is set up in an open way so that um, also other websites and other players can use uh, the trip planning capabilities and access them um, in, in an open way and communicate with this platform. Um, about data ownership, um, of course data is valuable, so the ownership is definitely not to be neglected, neglected and also very important. Um, 
what we as a technical integrator um, are very keen on is to make sure that the data doesn't flow over from one operator to another by accident within our platform. So we make very strict uh, to separate the data of the different operators um, within the platform. Um, it should, however, and this is um, also reflecting a bit my, my personal opinion, it should be possible, however, to exchange this data, maybe also in exchange for monetary value, right? I, I believe that we will see uh, some sort of uh, data marketplaces um, where different entities can exchange their data and profit from the insight that they generate uh, from, from, from one another, right? Uh, but this uh, needs all to be um, set up in a way that it really reflects the value of data and also um, the economy behind it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think that brings us to a close for today. So thank you very much, Robert, and also Jan and Thomas for your time in uh, in your and your contributions and insights today. Um, now, for our audience, as you leave the webinar today, a survey is going to appear on your screen, which will ask you to rate today's session. Uh, if you could just take a moment to provide your feedback, that'd be really fantastic. Uh, if now isn't a good time, then the survey will be sent to you shortly via email. And if you could complete it when you can, we would really, really appreciate it. So on behalf of Intelligent Transport and Siemens Mobility, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And I'm sure I will see you again on the next one. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye. Thanks.